Our next presenter is a man named Mr. Greg Bischoff. Uh, Greg has been with the Texarkana Gazette for 25 years as a reporter. Uh, some of you might also know that he's been responsible for some of the historical accounts of the killings that have been put out in the Texarkana Gazette. Um, interestingly, also in the new movie, uh, you briefly see one of the articles that Greg, Greg wrote being flashed during the montage. So his, his work is actually in the new movie in that, in that context. He also wrote one of the best reviews for the new movie. If you haven't seen his review, it's, it's probably among the most sophisticated reviews out there. Um, I'm going to run Greg's slides for him. That would be great. I want to first um, want to thank you all for being here. I have to say that after we did a special section regarding the Phantom Killer on the 50th anniversary, this is 1996, I became intensely interested in more of the details surrounding the killings, and so I began to research wherever I could find documents, and that included the Texas County Public Library, where they had old city directories, uh, one that went as far back as 1943, and then I found two of them. One was 1945, the other 1947. I thought those would be the best research. And I started this in the late 1990s. I eventually was began to get interested in what the city limits of Texarkana looked like at that time. So I went to Texarkana, Texas, and they had a 1945 map of the city. It was about three feet wide, seven feet long. And uh, I was able to find out a lot of the, of the locations of, the, of what was cited in a lot of our newspapers. And then, now, for Texarkana, Arkansas, what I did is I went over to see, they didn't actually have a map, so I went over to see what they had, and they had records of their land annexations, and their last land annexation was 1941. The next one after that was 1952. So, oh, I wasn't sure about that. We just had a shifting of the slide. Did, did, um, someone, did someone touch the vertical control on the projector? Because I think we're, our, our projection's a little too high now. No, Okay, I'm not sure, um, interesting. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll try to make do then. Okay, here we are um, for the Texas side. What you see there would be from the map of 1945. And then what you see here in, on the Arkansas side, that was drawn in for me by uh, a, a city staff member who knew the, the different annexations from the city's genesis all the way up to about 1941. And that's where the city extended until 1941. And then their, their next one wasn't until 1952. So based on that, uh, as best I could, that's what the city looked like in 1946, the city limits. And from there, I got interested in the sites. Seeing there, there were 36 phantom sites I was able to identify through police records and things that were either related to the victims or related to the suspects. And, and to the law officers. And I got interested in researching to find out exactly where those sites were. So what happened, I was able to locate 36 and I began to go out and see what was left of them. And I identified about 27 of the sites that are still left. And, and of course, some of the buildings have been torn down since then where Polly Ann Moore lived. Um, she lived at 1215 Magnolia Street. That was when North State Line Avenue was a two-lane street back in 1946. It was later extended to five lanes. So what happened was that boarding house she was in was eventually, um, it was, had to be torn down. And you had several other buildings like that that no longer exist. Uh, uh, where Richard Griffin stayed at 155 Robinson Court, that was another building that eventually I was able to take a picture of, but it didn't last long. It was in pretty bad shape, and eventually that was torn down. But there are still about 27 sites here that are phantom related that I would like to talk to you about. The first ones, the first set I'm going through would be the sets, I mean, the, the sites that were related to the victims themselves. And then after that, um, there's uh, about 10 others where we have, uh, well, what, what they are, they're related to law enforcement and, and, the, and the suspects. So I'll go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the first attack here where uh, it was with, with Jimmy Thomas and Mary Jean Larry. Okay, you have here, let me see, on the map, over oh, that, what was going over there? I'm cutting off the top, sorry about that. Oh, no, that's not all right. What we have there would be the intersection of 
Richmond Road and Stevenson Street. It kind of lines up with Blanton where, uh, with Blanton Street where Mary Jean Larry ran to the very last house she could. Um, this area, okay, it, it's still relatively rural in that in that part. And uh, we have another, uh, let's, let's go to the next side after that, over here. Uh, I'll go ahead and show you on the map what that is. Now, Stevenson Street right there, okay, a um, little further on up the bird, it extends, okay, is probably about where they were parked at that intersection. Now, um, according to, uh, I think, the statement that Jimmy Hollis made, they, were, they weren't actually a, a mile north of the Beverly area, because we're right on the Beverly area right here. What uh, seemed to, to line up as far as what would make sense would, would be was that uh, when they were attacked in Mary Jean Lay, when she ran, she ran as far as she could to the very end of Blanton Street where it stopped at a, a creek. The last house is 805 Blanton. And um, that would make more sense as, as far as uh, the location because she would have a straight line to run here. And we'll go ahead and check out the um, 805 Blanton next slide. Okay, well, well, let's go ahead and give you another look at the location. This is just a, a different shot. What you saw in the first, in, in the first, Slide was um, I was standing next to the to the um, across the street um, next to the stop sign and now I just um, uh, went over to the other side to kind of kind of again give you a a look at still how relatively rural that area is and how it would make kind of a a, a lover's lane site there and okay so yeah go ahead and check that we'll go ahead and check that yeah but again it's like it's about right about right. In that area of Stephen Street, well, I'm sorry, a little, little further on up, where it nearly lines up with Blanton Street. Okay, uh, next slide. Now that would be the home at 805 Blanton Street. The home, to me, um, looks a little modern. The the actual house uh, appears to be more made out of plastic, so it may have, it may have been rebuilt um, rather than the wood. There is, it, I think. It, seems a little more modern, or it, it, it's actually plastic, but that's the site of the house, the very last house at 805 Blanton, where she ran into. Okay, next slide. And you can see that um, uh, it wasn't too far from that house, just a little to the right, where you would have a, uh, let's see, a creek right there. So it was the very last house. To this day, it still is. Okay, next slide. Thank you. I only have one photograph here related to uh, the Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore slayings. Th this photograph right here was taken about 100 yards south of where South Robinson Road intersects with US Highway 67. And you can tell that it's, it, it's still relatively rural in that area. I'll go ahead and show you that on the map. Oh, next slide, please. All right. Now, this is what's interesting here. Okay, this is, this is the location about where you see the red right there where the car was well, was found. Now it's about 100, it's, it's about 100 yards off of US Highway 67. Now what's interesting about this is that at that time, Robinson Road, where it goes south and then crosses 67 goes down, and then goes further south, that was not a true street back then. There, this portion of Robinson Road did not exist. Uh, what happened was it, it did go down all the way to what you see as Wagner Street. Now, now, Wagner was the original Robinson Road where it curved a little bit and then intersected with US Highway 67, which means this portion of it right down, right here, never had a through street. It was a little more isolated. It, it connected to Highway 67, but it didn't go across Highway 67 and north like it does today, so that made it a little more of an isolated area. I found this out from a, a photograph that was shown to me by the owners of Dots Rental that is a, just a little further north. It's probably located about right here now. And um, a lady who was 10 years old at the time, she showed me a photograph of what the area looked like. And, and sure enough, Robinson Road actually curved off and was part of Wagner Street back then. And it, uh, it, did not, it was not a pure street. So that made that area a little more isolated. Okay, next slide. All right, now, I'm gonna skip over to um, the, the, the Starks uh, uh, murder case. This, what we, you see right here, is old Highway 67. Um, which is where the truck is, is new, is, is the new 
two highway, probably probably built in the 50s or 60s, but this is what the old one looked like. It's, it's fairly narrow. I'm right at about the 10th mile marker where that where the green sign is over there. And so for, perhaps their home is not there anymore, but it was probably in, in, in this area. I'm not sure if it was on the other side of the tracks, but this is what, uh, th there are some portions of this highway still left. Uh, so um, just to, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting that you have uh, some areas that are still left that, that, that haven't been taken out yet, but uh, go ahead, next, next slide. Okay, here it is um, along Highway 67. Uh, the old 67 was kind of parallel with, with the, the new highway, so it was kind of running along this area. Um, this is, um, it was probably a little further north, but uh, this is where, uh, along this area, where this is where you have uh, the, the rural scenery. It's probably a little off the map there, but it's pretty close to about 10 miles. Okay, next slide. We have here would be uh, the former Michael Mayer Memorial Hospital where Katie Starks was taken after she was injured. Now, what, you, what you're looking at here is the modern, is the modern architecture of it. Perhaps, I believe, the old hospital may be somewhere underneath uh, the, the, new, uh, the, the, the new hospital we had here. After about, well, in 1948, they built Michael Mayer Hospital about where I'm standing to take this photograph. It, it'd be back behind me. And they wanted, they, they, they soon turned that into the, a nun's convent, but they wanted that building, the old hospital, to look like their ho the hospital they opened in 1948. So the architecture is similar um, there. And that's why it looks like it does today now. Um, it's older, the, the hospital's older look at a much more decorative architecture, but this is the location it would look like today. Okay, next slide, please. That would be about right where that, the, where it says post office, where the T is. That's about the location at 503 Walnut Street, where you can find that today. Next slide. This would be the First United Methodist Church where um, Virgil and Kitty Starks were members, and Virgil had his, his funeral here. This church burned down in May of 2000, uh, of 2000. It was, uh, it, it, it looked exactly like this, and what was interesting is they didn't have any of the blueprints of the church left, but they did have, it was very well photographed and, uh, and, and very well documented as far as both the interior and exterior look goes. So they were able to restore the, the interior and exterior architecture of the church to about 98% of what it was. So they, they did a very good job of rebuilding it. But anyway, that's where Virgil Starks uh, had his funeral. Next slide. And that would be located about right, let's see, um, at the corner of 6th and Laurel, I believe, in, in, in that net right there. Okay, next slide. This is Hillcrest Cemetery, and this is where um, Virgil and Katie Starks um, um, are buried. Now, she was later remarried and had a, a, a husband, and, and her husband, who's Mr. Sun, he's, he's buried here too, but anyway, that's their location at Hillcrest Cemetery. Next slide. That would be, of course, off the map here where uh, we, uh, it'd be somewhere over more in this direction where Hillcrest is, where West 7, US, which is US Highway 67, goes further on down, which you can probably find it. Okay, I'm to about that area there. Okay, next slide. This would be the, um, the um, old veterans of Ford War, the, the VFW area, um, the, the, the building where Betty Jo Booker was playing the night with Jerry Atkins Band. Now, this is not the original building. The original one, I believe, was made out of wood, and it burned down in about 1962. So it was replaced by a more modern brick building, but this would be the exact same location of where that was. So go ahead and uh, next slide. That would be located, I believe, just north of the Texarkana Public Library, about, about right here. Okay, next slide. This, of course, would be the entrance to Spring Lake Park, I believe, where Paul Martin's car was found up the road a little bit, not, not, not too far away. But uh, this is a, a historical interest itself because you can tell from the architecture of the entrance that a lot of, of, of the stone wall there was probably part of either WPA projects that were built in the 1930s. Okay, next slide. Okay, now, that would be located about right, park entrance about right, right in this area. And where you see blue here, this is where, uh, where uh, when Paul Martin and 
Betty Jo Cook and they were kidnapped where um, the, the suspects where they drove their car and now Paul Martin was found in this area here of uh, North Park Road and Betty Jo Booker uh, probably a little off of the modern street here called um, Burnwood which was not there at the time and more and more slain went on through now more slain disappeared for a while but they're, they're reconstructing it uh, now so that, that's kind of the area if you were to look at a modern map you see where the interstate goes today. That's the, that's the area where that's the area that that, that, that we should find where it intersects near the Sun Hill Road. Okay, next slide. This would be Betty Jo Booker's house. The location is 35 is 3107 Anthony Street. Now, um, a lot of I think well, we had um, some newspaper articles that said it was 3105, but I looked in the 1945 city directory. And it identifies her mom, uh, uh, Mrs. Clark Brown, living at 3105 Anthony Street. And I'll show you what that is. Next slide. Okay, that would be in the old Sussex Downs area of Texarkana, about there, there, about right there. Where she lived. Next slide. Now, this is the old Texarkana, Texas High School. It's, it's fenced in now and Tell that the, the, the trees are kind of overgrown and it's still a historic site, but that's where she went to school and that building is, is, is still here. Okay, next slide. That would be about right, looking at, at Pine Street. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Right here. About in that area right there would, is where the, the, the school is still standing. It is, uh, still has its 1929 architecture. Thank you. Right here would be roughly the location of where uh, Betty Jo Booker was found. Now, I think we're, 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 we have the street that's right in front of us, Burnwood, it intersects with Galleria Oaks, which is basically an extension of the Morris Lane that they're working on now that's coming in, in, in the same direction that crosses the Calhoun Creek further right here. She would probably be, if, if this, if the murder actually happened today, probably right on the street of, of Galleria Oaks, but back then the wood, the wooded area came further, uh, was, was, um, was further here to the left and much closer to the, the Fernwood intersection, but that would, that would be where they probably found her in, in the wooded area where you see the intersection here of Fernwood and, um, and Galleria Oaks if, if um, had these two um, highways never um, existed here. Slide. That would be again right. We're looking at that. This kind of older map of Texarkana, um, where Morris Lane kind of disappeared into a trail for a while, but they're 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 recently doing that. So it'd be about about right there. Okay. Slide. Beach Street First Baptist Church. That's where Betty Jo Booker. I believe she was a member of that church, and that's where they had her funeral. But the church itself is is, is very historical and. and what you see there is exactly the way it looked in 46 and uh, when it was first built toward the turn of the century. Okay, next slide. Right. That would be the church be located about right here, Beach Street, since we're in the in 46. All right, next slide. Now, Woodlawn Cemetery is where Betty Jo Booker is buried. There, there's um, uh, there's the um, the plots for um, Betty Jo Booker and her dad and her brother. Now. What's interesting is that um, the whole, uh, all, for, for all three people here, they didn't, they didn't live, they weren't, they didn't live very long, of course. And Betty Jo Booker was only 15 years old. Now her, her brother, he was only 17 years old, and he was listed as dying in 1943. I'm thinking he may have had military service, may have been killed in World War II, but he was listed as dying, I believe, in February of, of 1943. And her dad, Blanton Booker, is buried there as well. Um, he only lived to be 31 years old. Okay, next slide. And that, of course, is um, Woodlawn, just behind the state line cemetery. About right here would be the location of Booker's <coughs> Next slide. This would be the home where Paul Martin's mom lived. I think he uh, visited her um, the, the night that, um, that he was slain, or earlier that evening. This is at um, 1224. Locust Street. And now, 
what you see there, the house still looks the same. Now, this one, you can tell that I took this around Halloween, but um, the, the, the house is still, uh, it, it looks very much the same in, in, in that area. I don't think anything has been done as far as any add-ons or anything. Next slide. That would be located about right, yeah, about right here. There are historical residential dis district of Mr. Jones. Okay, next slide. What we have here would be um, where, um, where Paul Martin was found. Um, well, uh, it was actually much further on, but I'm standing very close to the intersection of, Nor of to what is today's North Park Road and Summerhill Road. I'm standing almost to that intersection and taking an eastward view of the area, probably further on down into that residential area is probably where Paul was, was found. So um, if you kind of a, a look, um, it's not as rural as it once was, but, but you know, it, it still looks like it's kind of a, a somewhat isolated area. Next slide. Okay, so that would be, again, let's see, in, I would be standing about right there and, and taking an eastward view along that area. Next slide. This would be the old Texarkana funeral home where both uh, Amy, uh, Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin were taken at, after, after their, their murders. Um, and this building goes back to 1921. It still retains a great deal of, it, of its architecture, but very original looking, but that building still exists. Uh, that would be um, uh, at 6th and, oh, let's see, close to May. Oh, next slide, I'll show you that on the map here. That would be about right. Uh, right there is where it's standing today. Still in the shift. Next slide. Back. Okay, now, you can tell there the, the marker here for Paul Martin is a little faded, but he and his, and his relatives are, 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 are buried here. This is also in Hillcrest Cemetery. Okay, next slide. And again, um, for Hillcrest, um, it would be much, it would be probably more in this area there because uh, it, it slides off the map, but uh, Hillcrest is on U.S. Highway 67. This would be the home that uh, Betty Jo Booker's um, parents moved to after her slaying. This is just two blocks up from where um, Paul Martin's mom lives and or, or lived at that time. This is um, 1419 Locust Street. The house looks like it, it's fairly new, uh, fairly modern, but um, it, it does have the same address. I, um, I don't know that much about architecture, so it, it, it may be the same, but anyway, that's where they moved in about 1947, okay? Uh, next slide, thank you. And that would be about right, yeah, about right there. Uh, I'm sorry. That area right, right here, right here. All right, next slide. Okay. Now, here's something interesting. When Yule Sweeney was led to the Miller County Courthouse by Max Tackett and Tillman Johnson, they went up these, these, these steps right here, which at that time led to um, what was then the location of the Miller County Sheriff's Office, right up uh, today, it would be the tax assessor's office, but those steps, some um, um, Tillman told me about um, leading him right up those steps to the Sheriff's Office, and they caught him in about July of 1946 at the Jefferson Coffee Shop, okay? Next slide. And of course, the Miller County Courthouse is actually marked right here at um, 400 block of Laurel Street. There it is. Next slide. Now, this is an old photograph of the sheriff's office, but the reason we inserted this among um, the, the modern photographs was because that wall, as you see it for the most part, in the sheriff's office, which is now the tax assessor's office, still exists. Now, next slide, please. You can tell. Now, they, they made the, the door at the far left a little doorway a little wider now, but that's that wall still exists there. So it's where those, those six men stood. Next slide. Again, that would be at the Miller County Courthouse. Um, right there, it's, it's about this kind of older map that was located about right there, okay? Next slide. This would be the old Arkansas Motor Coach Company. It's attached to the Hotel McCartney. I would be standing about right where the Jefferson Coffee Shop was maybe, it, it, it probably still maybe a little further behind me, but uh, if you want to get a kind of a, a, a better location of where the Jefferson Coffee Shop would be, Bed, if we're still standing today, this would probably be a good um, landmark right here. This part that is attached to, to the Hotel McCartney, um, the, the um, old Arkansas 
motor coach company, or what's left of it anyway. Um, next slide. That would be, let's see, about right here where the Bi-State Justice Building is now, um, and uh, the uh, Jefferson Coffee Shop would be about right there. You can see where State Line would split the Bi-State Justice Building right here between the two states. So we just a little to the left of that line where the Arkansas Motor Coach and then the Jefferson Coffee Shop now gone, and we just a little to the right. Okay, next slide. This would be the former site of the Joy Theater. This is where uh, Peggy Sweeney and Yul Sweeney um, frequented the, 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 this place, and she mentions it several times in her statements to the uh, to police. Now, um, it's the former Collins and, and Williams uh, men's clothing store upstairs where we have law offices. They re-exposed the uh, original architecture or, or, or the, the original facade over a few years back, but anyway, that's where the Joy Theater stood at that time. Next slide, please. And that would be located just, it was at 104 East Broad, so it'd be just about right there, a little, little north of where, um, at, the, at the far northeastern corner of where the Bryce State would be. All right, next slide. All right, we have here what is the former Swan Hotel. Now, it used to be three stories tall, it is now one story. And that's because it burned in 1952, but that was another place where Peggy Sweeney, um, she, she hung out. And so um, what, what you see here, the, the original stone archways, I thought was a good idea that they were, that they were recovered by the Harrelson Law Firm that moved into it, and because uh, that gives it a much more decorative architecture that used to be plastered over, but it gives you a much more historic look of what that hotel looked like uh, um, back then. And the uh, course hotel then is just right over here. Next slide. I'll show you about where that's located. That would be going down, down State Line Avenue just to the to the right of, of, of the avenue and, and just across the street from the hotel there. Okay. Next slide. This would be the location of where the Busy Bee Cafe was located uh, back in 1946. Um, this address is now called the Flower Child Butt. It, they had the same address according to the 1945 and 1947 uh, city directories. The Busy Bee Cafe was located at, I believe, 112 Pine Street, and that would be the exact address of this, this uh, uh, business uh, right here. Now, the uh, front portion here, of course, I believe is more modernized, but the back portion would be more of a historic uh, portion of the building. But anyway, that's where the Busy Bee Cafe was located again. Neil Sweeney and Peggy Sweeney were, were frequent, seem to be frequent guests there. Okay, next slide. That would be located, uh, we're looking at about, okay, about in that area right there where you would have a parking lot where the Savoy Hotel used to be, then just a little to the, um, to the uh, left side or to the, um, to the east of the, what is now the Bi-State Justice Building. Okay, next slide. This is a business building in, well, right now, it's, it, it is abandoned. It used to be an old roofing company there. And the front facade, of course, has changed some, I'm sure, since 1946. But this was, an, this was a building identified by Peggy Sweeney when she was, uh, when, when she was just kind of a random residence here and there. And I believe her family may have owned this building, but she, she stayed there, I believe it was also a business building and a residence at the same time, and she stayed there uh, ever so often as she was mentioned in her, uh, in her uh, statements to the police. Okay, next slide. That would be located about right, let's see, this way. probably about right in that area there. Okay, next slide. This, of course, is the Hotel Grimm, and this is a place where Newspapers, radio, a lot of, of the media stayed during the months of the Phantom Killings, and um, it's it, of course it's, a, it's a run down now. But there, there, there's plans to restore it, I believe. Um, that there still are, and it. But beyond that, it still re re retains a lot of his, uh, his historic flavor and architecture. Here. Next slide. Of course, that would be right. It would be located about right here, um, just to um, on the um, on the um, uh, west side. State Line Avenue across from the old Swan Hotel, which is now the Harrelson Law Office. Okay, next slide. This would be where the 
Bowie County Sheriff's Office was located in 1946. Again, this was identified in both the 1945 and 1947 city directories. Right where you see the, the middle doors, that would be, that's called two, that's 214 and a half Main Street. It was this brick building right here where quite a few suspects were questioned in that, in that both within the sheriff's office. And next slide. That would be located about right, okay, 3rd Street, okay, Main Street, yeah, Main Street, that would be just before you get to Broad right here, not too far down from where the Pro Theater is, it's still there, right about there. Next slide. Again, this is what we're looking at in terms of the, of the city limits of Texarkana at that time. This was taken on an older map, but still, we can kind of tell the look of where the, uh, where the city stands. So, uh, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, John.